basis of uh, what I was forming my talk around. I did a little rewriting of her song today. Uh, so this is the Truth Hurts Data Modeling Edition. Okay, so if you know the song, you'll kind of follow along with it. And if you don't, go listen to it and then you'll, you'll get it. Okay, so I just did this today, this morning on my walk. So we'll see how it goes. Why does my data model great until it needs to be great? I just took a DNA test Turns out my data model is 100% wrong, even when I'm crying crazy. Yeah, I got data problems, that's the human in me, but bling bling, when I'm gonna solve them, that's the goddess in me. You could have had Apache Cassandra help you with your career, just a little bit. They won't hold you down or hold you back, and the sound of them will be of them calling you back. Why does my data model great until it needs to be great? Don't page me, tell it straight to my face. My organization sent me to ApacheCon to get these problems out of my hair. Fresh ideas that are so enlightening, a new data model with Cassandra. Truth hurts, I guess I needed something more exciting. Okay, so if you know the song, you now understand my rewritten lyrics. So hopefully you enjoyed that. That was a fun thing for me to do today. All right, so what are we actually gonna be talking about? No more fun and games, right? We're gonna do some comparison of relational databases and NoSQL databases. We're gonna talk about the benefits of Apache Cassandra. We're gonna talk about transitioning to an Apache Cassandra data model. And I'm gonna talk about some common issues solved by a good data model uh, for Apache Cassandra. Um, and I was asked earlier about my Twitter handle. You'll see it down there at the bottom, uh, which is Amanda K underscore data. So let's just talk a little bit about me here for a second. So um, my always, so I'm an Apache committer and PMC member on Apache Trifodian. Apache Trifodian is a SQL on top of Hadoop or HBase uh, type transactional SQL layer. Um, and I did all the initial installation work for that project. And I still keep up with it even though, uh, you know, now I'm working for Apple. So uh, I'm a current uh, field engineer in the Apple Cloud Services uh, organization. In the past, I've worked for Datastax and Databricks and Teradata and HP. I really like companies with uh, data in the name. <laughs> uh, and I like uh, distributed systems that deal with that data. So uh, I have a bachelor's from the University of Washington and a master's from Santa Clara. And uh, the things that I love are Disney, dogs, and running. All right, so let's jump in right into uh, when should we be using a relational database? So we're gonna kind of compare and contrast relational and NoSQL. And, and you might be thinking, okay, well, I know the difference. Okay, and, and maybe you do, and that's wonderful. Uh, but you're going to see how that flows into um, how we're going to be doing our data modeling differently. And it's directly because of these uh, differences between the two systems. So I want to make sure that I point it out, It'll just make a lot more sense uh, when you realize how you have to transi transition your data model. So when you should use relational. So if you need to use SQL, if everyone on your team knows SQL, um, you need that kind of um, that query language, um, you know, for NoSQL databases, uh, especially Apache Cassandra, they have similar type uh, query languages, but they're not identical. Another thing is if you need to use joins or do aggregations or do analytics, that's really where the bread and butter of a relational database is. Um, NoSQL databases in Apache Cassandra, uh, they're not very, most of them don't support joins. Uh, doing aggregations, again, uh, not necessarily, and they're not really built for analytics. Right, they're not they're not built for those types of um, of queries. If you have smaller data, so NoSQL and Apache Cassandra, it's really built for big data, not for smaller data. There's no use in in having the overhead of a distributed system and a distributed database if you just have small data. If you need flexibility in your queries, so if you have a lot of ad hoc queries that you do, um, then you may again you may want to think about uh, using a relational database um, instead of a NoSQL one. And we'll talk about a uh, little bit of the inverse and the difference between them. Um, but Apache Cassandra doesn't, I could argue it, it does just fine. We, there's workarounds for doing ad hoc, ad hoc queries. Uh, but nevertheless, if you just do a lot of ad hoc queries, you might want to think about using relational. If you need ACID transactions, if you need that, um, you know, NoSQL databases, for the most part, uh, especially Apache Cassandra, don't support ACID. 
Um, actually, uh, an open source database that does, uh, an example of that is FoundationDB. It actually does support asset transactions and is a NoSQL database. So there are exceptions to the rule, uh, but if we're just talking about Cassandra, it does not. And the simplicity, right? Um, if, you, if you just have small data, simple queries, you don't really need the overhead of NoSQL. So when not to use it? Okay, so there's kind of, these are kind of the inverse of what we just talked about, right? So if you have a large amount of data, relational uh, may or may not work for you. Uh, if you need true high availability, a lot of relational databases, they have a single point of failure. And there's time that you're going to have to deal with when you do have a failure that you're gonna have to hot swap that. Uh, and so that's gonna lead to not having a highly available up all the time, no downtime type of system. If you need really high read performance, um, you may not want to think about using relational. You may want to start thinking about using NoSQL. Uh, because of that, um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, read performance here in a little bit. Um, but uh, relational is not because of those joins and those ad hoc queries and the aggregations. It's not really built for, uh, for high read performance. If you need flexibility in your schema, so NoSQL databases and Apache Cassandra, they, they provide flexibility in your schema where it's much more rigid and relational. And it's easier if you need to store different types of file formats. Um, some relational databases are okay with that, and but as just a general rule, kind of at a high level, they're not. So again, when to use NoSQL, again, these are kind of just the inverse of kind of what we've already been talking about. But if you truly need that high availability, that's where NoSQL comes into the picture. If you have big data, if you need linear scalability, so we'll talk about that. I think we talked about that a little bit later. Um, so with a NoSQL database, it's very, especially Apache Cassandra, it's very easy to add nodes. And as you add those nodes, it actually gives you that linear scalability. And when you add them, it you don't even need a restart of the database. Um, you just bootstrap the node in and it's good, it's good to go essentially. Yeah, you have to wait for the data to stream to it. So um, it, it does take a little bit of time in that aspect. But um, after the data streams to it, um, you're, you're good to go and you, you've added that capacity and performance to your, to your cluster. If you need low latency and you need fast reads and fast writes, so not just fast writes, but also fast reads. If you have a distributed users, um, NoSQL, especially Apache Cassandra, is really built for that because you can have your full Apache cluster with multiple data centers um, and having that data stream between them. Um, and you don't have to copy that data. The data is going to get replicated throughout the data centers and the full cluster um, just automatically. And if you need flexibility with your schema. So again, just kind of to reiterate when not to use it, if you really need to use SQL, because um, Apache Cassandra, for example, uses CQL, and we're going to talk about that in a second, um, and it's not the same as SQL. If you need asset transactions, because Apache Cassandra does not support asset transactions, uh, I guess, in a sense, I might argue uh, with you if why you really need asset transactions. Um, sometimes people think that they do need them and they really don't. Um, I would I would really think about your use case and really consider whether that's that's the case or not. If you do, then then so be it until you should go with relational database. But if you really don't, or for not all of your use cases you don't, you may want to consider using Apache Cassandra or, or an OSQL database. If you need to be able to do joins, uh, again, uh, I may argue with you that maybe you don't need that. And that's what we're going to talk about here a, a lot with our data modeling talk, um, why you don't need joins. Uh, but if you really do need them, then you're not going to be able to have a NoSQL database. Um, if you need to be able to do a lot of those ad hoc queries, and if you have small data. If you have small data, there's really no point in, in going about all of this. All right. So why should you use Apache Cassandra? So um, because I kind of was talking more generally about NoSQL, so let's talk about just Cassandra itself. So Cassandra itself, and most of you are probably uh, maybe Cassandra experts out there, but for those of you who aren't, and uh, let's just kind of go over this a little bit. So Cassandra has a leaderless architecture, which gives you true high availability. All the nodes in the cluster do the exact same job. Um, when you come in to do a write, that, that node will, and we'll talk about the write path here in a bit, it will act as a coordinator node during that time. But after that, it, it gives up that, after that writes then, it gives up that, that task, it's no longer the coordinator, and you, tru you truly have a leaderless architecture. So any node can go down, and that's, that's totally fine because there's no leader. 
Uh, I talked about this a little bit earlier. It's really easy to scale with no downtime and you truly get that linear scalability as you add in more nodes, you get better performance. And like I said, uh, you don't even need a restart, which I think is really impressive. Uh, so it's built for fast reads and writes and all the nodes are ready for those reads and writes. And we're gonna talk about um, how Cassandra's really built for fast writes and how we're gonna help it with our data model get that fast read. And do I really have to say it? The true thing is our amazing community. So all of you out there, all of the committers on this project, all the various people that just are in the Apache Cassandra community are all truly amazing. Anytime you need help, um, there's so many different forums to get that help or get training. Um, it's really an amazing community and uh, it's definitely there for, for you, uh, you know, as you're working through this, this transition uh, from either a relational database or a different type of NoSQL database. There's a lot of people out there to help. Okay, so let's talk about, when we talk about low latency, I really wanna dig into how, how, how can that be? So this is where I like to talk about the right path for Apache Cassandra, because this is what proves that low, why you're able to get that low latency. So the right path is really, I call it beautiful in its simplicity. It's so simple and that's why it just, it just makes intuitive sense once you hear it for the first time. So let's talk a little bit about the right path from the client to the cluster. So if you're the client, and you are going to write uh, a piece of data, uh, let's say that data is A, um, it's gonna come in to one of the nodes, it's gonna hit one of the nodes. Um, if your client um, is using one of the uh, Cassandra drivers, it may actually already be token range aware. And in that case, it would actually go to the node um, that, that it actually needs to go to and, be, and to write that piece of data. Um, in this case, let's say that uh, you're not using a driver that is token range aware, uh, you're just using the client and so it's just going to hit uh, the node that you point it to essentially so in this particular case it's going to hit node a and what like i said before node a is going to take on that role as a coordinator node it's going to figure out which node uh, or nodes i should say that that data piece of data needs to be written to within the token range so in this particular case you're seeing that this piece of data needs to be written to b and to a b and c and what happens, and, and I don't want to talk too much about consistency levels here, because uh, that's not really the part, the, the main part of this talk. But what's going to happen is, depending on your consistency level, it's going to figure out how many of those writes need to be successful before it returns back to the client. So if your consistency uh, level is one, uh, it'll write to one node and then return back to the client that it was successful. Um, and then after that, the um, it will be an asynchronous call that will write the the other nodes. Uh, at the same time, it just, whoever gets done first will let the client know that it's it's been successful. And that's that's it, it's very simple. So let's talk about um, on the internals of that. So uh, it's a little, it's, it's same kind of process. Uh, so let's just go into it in a little bit more detail. So if you go to write that, you're getting your zero, so I have this numbered zero through three. Step zero, you're gonna get a request from the client, just like we did here on the other side. and it's, at the very same time, an asynchronous call is gonna to go to the commit log and it's gonna uh, append to the commit log and write to the mem table uh, that's in memory. And that's what's gonna happen on each one of the nodes that, uh, that you're writing to, and then it's gonna return back to the client. So again, very simple and it's a, like beautiful in sim its simplicity, it, that's really all it is. And then over time, you see here at, at number three, eventually that mem table, um, once it gets full, is gonna to flush to, to disk and, and then it's gonna persist as an SS immutable table. And, and that's, really, that's really all there is to it. All right, so we've talked about why there's fast writes, but why is there fast reads? And this is where we get into, now we're getting into uh, how we can do this with a good data model. So to get those fast reads, that's what it depends on. It depends on us. Um, so right, you don't get anything for free. And once I figured this out about Cassandra, it just made so much more sense to me. Like once I figured out, okay, it was built for these really fast writes and then I have to do my part, nothing's for free, and I have to give it a good data model to get these fast reads. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in just a bit, but right, your data is gonna be partitioned across uh, your cluster and across your nodes. And so with that, we have to help it figure out where is what I'm looking for, which node does it live on? Right, and so that's by the way we partition our data and we basically point to that partition in our, in our query. 
So in that aspect, we'll query only one node and return the data. And that gives us kind of, it gives us not kind of, it gives us constant time read access. So if you look here at my query here, select star from my table where artist equals Lizzo. So in this particular case, what I'm seeing is that, or what we can uh, assume is that our data is partitioned across our cluster by artist. Uh, probably not the best way to partition data, but that's a totally different conversation. <laughs> but nevertheless, we know it's partitioned by that. And then that's what we're going to, to point to in our where clause. Okay, so like I said, data modeling is different. That's the whole point of this talk. Relational data modeling does Apache Cassandra data modeling. Uh, one of the things just to point out here is the difference between the two query languages, uh, Cassandra query language and SQL or SQL. And I always say Cassandra query language because I'll just flip them and, and say the wrong one and everyone will be confused. <laughs> Uh, but for SQL, so for just, this is just an example of a query. You can do a select star from song, a table of songs, and you can join it on the artist, uh, join it on the artist table on a common ID. So in this case, we have song.artistID equals artist.ID. And, and what we would do is we're getting data back from both of those tables and sending that back. Uh, with uh, Cassandra query language, we can't do that. Uh, there are no joins. And so this particular case, we would only be able to do a select star from my table where, and then artist equals whatever artist I'm looking for and how I've partitioned it. So let's talk a little bit about data modeling for relational databases. This is what that really means. So that we can talk about how we're gonna transition into doing that for Cassandra. So relational is all around normalization. So uh, normalization was um, really prescribed and developed in the 1970s, and it was all, and actually at IBM, and it was all around making sure that you reduce your data redundancy and increase your data integrity. So think about the systems of the 1970s. You can't have extra copies of that data. Uh, you don't have the space. It is so incredibly expensive. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever data that you're writing is only being written to one place. Um, and with that, I mean, it, while you're reducing that data redundancy and that having that lack of space, you are increasing data integrity. Your data is only written to one place. Um, so it, it can't be, um, you can't have any issues with the data being out of sync, for example. So that is a benefit of that. So uh, when you're talking about normalization for relational, you're talking about the various uh, normal forms. I think normal form actually goes up to six normal forms, but I don't think that's ever actually possible. Uh, I think it's only theoretical that they've had uh, different um, articles about. Um, but the more natural process is third normal form. That's what most of uh, when you're doing relational data modeling, that's what you're trying to achieve. Um, I, I've read a lot of articles about this and it says it's a natural process. I would argue it really isn't, um, but it feels like it if this is how you were formally trained. Um, I think most of us, myself included, when we started learning about databases and we learned about uh, SQL and data modeling, we, we did that for uh, relational databases first. So I think this process feels more natural, but in all honesty, I would argue that it really isn't. <laughs> so what does that mean? Uh, so with relational, because we've, we're only having one copy of that data and we are breaking up all of our, uh, into these smaller and smaller tables, what saves the day is joins. So the only way we can combine that data to get all of the information that we need is with a join. So ad hoc queries are, are okay. That's how you can just kind of, you can just, whatever your data model is, um, you can do any query that you want on it to get the data that you want. And so I say it's okay, but honestly, it's actually super expensive. Um, and they can take uh, a lot of resources and a lot of time. So here's just an example of that join, right? So if I have a, a table called song and a table called artist, and let's say I want, right, just like I wanna show on my playlist, I wanna show the song name, the year and the artist, right? That's just natural. So what I'm gonna have to do in this case is I'm gonna have to select star from song and join on artist. And then we need to join them on a common ID. In this particular case, uh, we have artist ID, artist ID and song and artist just ID in, in the artist table. And so if we do that, um, we'll get the results back. So for each song, we'll also get um, the artist. But what really saves the day? 
So we talked about joins. Yes, we have those and we have that ability, but like we said, they're super expensive. So what really saves the day, especially when we're talking about performance, and that's denormalization. So with denormalization, and now this goes for not only for NoSQL databases and Apache Cassandra, but also for relational databases. Um, so it'll reduce the need for joins by combining and adding tables. So add, well, I should say adding data to the tables. You don't want to add more tables. That's kind of the exact opposite of what we want to do because then you need more joins. So what this is going to do is really going to reduce the time for your reads because you're not having to do those expensive joins. But I will add a caveat, it will increase the time for writes, most likely because you're probably writing the same piece of data to multiple tables. Um, but if you're working, so if you're working with relational, that may be something you need to consider. If you're working with NoSQL, it's really not something you really need to keep in mind because the writes are so fast. So here's basically the combination of those two previous tables into one table. So here's the music table. Now we have our song, our ID, our song, our year, and our artist. And because in this particular case, I'm using a relational query, I can say select star from music and it's gonna give me back my, my playlist. So here's just some relational tips. So when you're doing relational data modeling, you really start with your data, right? And you model the data according to those normal forms. So you actually work slowly through the normal forms. You start with first normal form, then to second and to third. And you're always making sure you're reducing that data redundancy. So then you can determine your queries based off of your data model. So let's now talk about data modeling for Apache Cassandra. So what you, so basically everything that I've just said, you really need to flip it upside down. You really wanna start with your queries and your access patterns. And you're saying, wait, what are you talking about? How can I possibly know all of my queries that I need to do on my database? And I would argue with you because, you know, a, a database like Apache Cassandra, because it's built for um, applications, right? It's an application database. When you think about it, when you really sit down, you whiteboard it out with your team, you really can make, you really can know all of your queries in advance. Maybe not every single one. And, and there may be some things that come down the line as you add new features, et cetera. But for the most part, if you really take the time and outline it and think about it, you really can get all of your queries uh, noted. Um, and, and, pro and provide the, the tables that correspond to that. So you're going to have to create a denormalized data model. That's really essential. There's really no way around it because we don't have joins. And you need to apply that model to your data. So just a reminder here, bolded and in red, denormalization of your tables for Apache Cassandra is absolutely critical. That's what you have to do to make sure that you have a good data model for Cassandra. So, okay, how are we gonna go about doing that? So we really, first we have to distribute the data. So it's all about, again, we got red and we got bold here. So you know it's important. It's all about the primary key. And I said, seriously, always, always, it's always about the primary key. So let's talk about what the primary key actually is. So what the primary key is going to do is actually it's gonna distribute your data across the cluster. And it's gonna do that. Uh, so the primary key, we'll talk about this in a second, but it's made up of the partition key and one or more clustering columns. So the partition key is what's going to uh, distribute it across the cluster. And it's also going to provide a uniqueness to that row of data. So in this particular table that I have, I say, uh, I'm gonna create the table. We're gonna call it cool jams. We're gonna have a column year, a column song, song name, a column artist name. And then we're gonna use a primary key and also, and it's also going to, this particular case, our primary key is also our partition key. And we're going to do that by year. So when you think about this table, so here's already a hint why this may be problematic, right? We think about what we're trying to save here, which is year, song name, and artist name. Uh, primary key and distributing by year, probably not going to give us a unique value, uh, most likely. Um, actually very likely. <laughs> so this isn't really the best example for uniqueness, but it's more around the idea of it just giving you of how you would partition partition the data. In some, some universe, partitioning by year for songs may work, but in ours it won't, uh, but you get the idea. And then just to follow up on that again, so your primary key can either just be made of just your partition key or one or more clustering columns. So let's talk a little bit more about that partition key. 
So it's what's actually going to determine the distribution of the data. So it's going to, um, the partition key is your row value hashed. So that's where once you, you feed in that, uh, that partition key, it's gonna get hashed to a value, which uh, needs to be unique, right? Because that's how it's going to be stored. And from there, that's where it's, you know where it's going to live on the token, uh, the token range. Uh, within your ring. So the, your Cassandra, we're all familiar with the Cassandra ring. That's where it'll live. So uh, in this particular example, I'm going to insert into my cool jams table, which has year, song name, and artist name, the values of 2018, Truth Hurts, and Lizzo. And so because we partitioned by year, 2018 is going to go into our hash function. It's going to pop out at 59. Um, just, just an example, it'll probably be something very different. And then once I go to write that to my token, my to my cluster, it will figure out which um, where 59 lives on the token range and what node that that node would that data would be on. And again, this is kind of highlighting again why year is probably not the best value to partition by because any other song that was written in 2018 would get hashed to 59 and that data would be overwritten. So let's take a second and talk about clustering columns. So again, you can have zero or or uh, or more of the clustering columns. So not only does it provide some uniqueness to your to your key, your primary key, it also sorts the data in ascending order, which is good to know. Um, so in this particular case, now we're seeing create table, cool jams, year, artist name, and song name, and their primary key is now our partition key is still year, but then we're adding a clustering column of artist name. So we see here it's actually starting to be less problematic, slightly, <laughs> because that value will uh, will hash to um, a unique, a more unique value uh, than what we had before with just year. Um, but in this particular case, it's still not good enough because we would have, uh, you know, uh, this is assuming an artist only has one song per year, which we know is wrong. Uh, but again, this is just an example for you all. So let's talk. Uh, about some data modeling best practices when we're dealing with Apache Cassandra. So I think I made it pretty clear from this from this talk is that you don't want to move your data model from relational over to Apache Cassandra as is. That's incredibly problematic. It's not going to work um, unless maybe all of your um, tables that you had in relational were all uh, denormalized and I don't know, it just seems very highly, highly unlikely. You're gonna have to go back to the drawing board and really think about what you're trying to do with, with Cassandra, what your application is trying to do, what kind of queries you need, et cetera. The likelihood of bringing it over one for one is very unlikely. So it, it really does take some thought, but if you do that upfront work, it, it'll pay off so much in the long run. Another thing is you might wanna think about using just one table per query. Um, so that's that's really key here and really important. Uh, and that's where we were talking about, you know, if you figure out your queries in advance, you can set your tables up for that. Um, so that way uh, it's it's much simpler. Um, and you're not trying to make your table unnatural so that it can fit more than one query. It's a much more natural process just to do the one table per one query. So know your queries in advance. We talked about that a little bit earlier before. Know your access patterns, you know, whiteboard it out with the team, figure it out. Once you have those, you can make the one table per one query and, and you're gonna be good to go. Also think about your where clause. Think about what you're actually, because like we've been talking about, you need to partition your data by something unique, but you need to make sure that when you're going to be writing those queries that you're going to have the value that you need in that where clause because the where clause is essential. You you can't do a select star from table in Apache Cassandra. Um, actually, technically you can if you allow filtering, which you should never ever do. Um, there's no reason for that. Uh, but um, you have to have this where clause, but you need to think about what values you will have in that moment to do that query. So for example, a really good way to partition um, and get those unique keys is by using a UUID. That will give you a unique key. Uh, it'll distribute it evenly across the cluster. That's all great. Uh, but this is like this is super long, confusing number and letters. I think there's letters in it too, if I recall correctly. You're most likely not going to have that uh, accessible to you to do your query. Maybe you will, uh, and then that's great. 
uh, but you just want to think about what you what you will have um, you know from your application from your users uh, to do that work clause. And also just another reminder that denormalization is your best friend. So uh, here's a really nice tweet. I got this a couple of years ago and it was actually a, a really good, uh, it was a, a really long thread on Twitter from Jeremy Daly. It's really great. So his was on how to switch from relational to DynamoDB in 20 steps. And so he had 20 tweets. Um, now in this particular case is talking about DynamoDB, uh, but nevertheless, it's just another NoSQL database. So I thought that this tweet was still, still applicable uh, to what we're talking about today. So in this particular case, he says, determine if your user access patterns require ad hoc queries that need to reshape the data. So we already kind of talked about that, right? When we're talking about relational and re, you know ad hoc queries. And in this particular case, he's even outlining uh, needing to reshape the data, right? So likely, if you're looking at a NoSQL database, the answer is no. However, if you're building an OLAP application, so something that does these ad hoc queries and these analytics and these aggregations, et cetera, then NoSQL is no good. Pat yourself on the back for trying and use another technology. So I really like this tweet because it's really, really highlighting the differences between what one um, type of technology is good for and what the other one is good for. Okay, so since we have a little bit of time here, I wanna talk about how to fix some common issues uh, that we've seen out there uh, that uh, these are a little bit more advanced than kind of the, the, the basics, but you know, once once you kind of get things uh, transferred over, and then um, you know some some issues that you may find uh, along the way. So there's data distribution issues, deleting data issues, and data integrity issues. So issues with your primary key. So we've I've already kind of talked about this quite a bit now, but make sure that that primary key actually gives you unique rows. Um, I've done that a lot just myself, especially when I was getting started. Um, I would think I was getting something unique and then my data was being overwritten and I wouldn't really realize why. Uh, and, and this happens out in, in, in even production systems as well. So make sure that you have that. Make sure that the primary key evenly distri distributes the data. So you wanna make sure that you're not gonna have um, you know, hot partitions where you've, you've picked a, a distribution or a partition key that actually doesn't distribute the data very evenly. Let's just think about like a, a good example uh, would be maybe state. If you're, if you're using a partition key of state, uh, because a lot more people live in the state of California like I do versus people who live in Rhode Island, right? So most likely that's probably not gonna distribute your data evenly. So that's all about testing, testing tests, stress tests for hot partitions. Um, that's how you're gonna kind of figure that out. Also make sure that your partitions are not too large. Um, I know there's a fix for that in Apache Cassandra 4.0, uh, but and if you're not using Apache Cassandra 4.0, uh, you can use bucketing to break up those large partitions. So let's talk a second about tombstones. Um, I know I might be getting close to my time here, so I'm gonna kind of speed it up here. But if you're not familiar with tombstones, if you're, if you're brand new to Cassandra, uh, tombstones are a deletion marker. So it actually, with Cassandra, it treats a delete as an additional insert or upsert, and they will be removed with compaction, but it really depends on what your compaction uh, schedule is, uh, whether this will be affect you and your cluster. So they happen uh, when you have a lot of deletes or just any deletes and inserting null values. So why is this so scary? Why is it called a tombstone? <laughs> so it impacts performance. It will cause slow reads. It will uh, fill up your disk space for sure, uh, especially if you have a lot of nulls or a lot of deletes. And this is kind of one of the reasons why we will actually see Apache Cassandra crash. Uh, Apache Cassandra is super stable, but a lot of tombstones will cause it to crash. So how do you prevent them? So first and foremost, avoid null. So when adding a row with an unknown column value, you don't know it yet, just leave it blank. You don't have to put null like you do in a relational database. You just don't say anything at all. Or when you're editing a row, uh, you can actually use unset uh, to remove that value. So only update the fields that you need. Don't add null, just add nothing, do nothing. Okay, and then just one last thing here around batches. So to increase the likelihood of having data integrity, you can actually use batches. Now this is not transactional um, in that sense, but it does kind of help you because you may be writing the same piece of data to many different tables. Um, and because of it, because you've done all that denormalization, batches really help you with that. 
So you can actually put all your inserts that you need to do of that same piece of data that are into other tables um, in the same batch. And they will, all they will all complete or an error will return with a timeout. So the error will return, again, it's not acid, there's no rollback, but at least you'll know that there was an issue and you'll know to go retry. So you start off a batch with begin batch, then your insert statements, and then apply batch and it will, it'll go. All righty, well, I hope that was helpful. Um, just as, as a note, uh, we are hiring at Apple. Um, we have our booth, uh, please come to our booth. I think we're open for a little bit longer, not quite sure, uh, but nevertheless, uh, access these links. We're hiring uh, on my team um, and, and Greater Apple, of course, internships and full-time. And thank you so much for this. This is wonderful. I hope you all learned something today and I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you all. So I don't know if we have time for questions. So I'm, I'm actually not quite sure when my session ends. <laughs> That's why we need the moderator. Thanks everyone. Oh, and Dan, you did find my Twitter. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, we do have a question around what's a good use case for changing from relational to NoSQL. Um, that kind of goes around, uh, think about your, so think about basically all of the applications that are actually on your phone. Um, that's always a good way I've heard a lot of my former colleagues state, um, you know, think of applications that need high availability, they always need to be up, you can have no downtime, um, those types of, and that need that fast reads and writes. Um, so think about think about Twitter, Twitter has a huge Cassandra cluster, uh, think about Netflix, um, things like that. So if you have applications that need that kind of high availability and scalability and read and write throughput, then you wanna think about using NoSQL and, 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 and probably Cassandra, but NoSQL for sure. Good question. Awesome, everyone. Well, like I said, I'm not quite sure when my session is over, but I think I think it's now. So I'm gonna sign off and thank you all for joining. And thank you for coming to ApacheCon. And I hope to see you all hopefully in person next year, <laughs> next year or the year after that. Alrighty, everyone, stay well. Thank you.